He was still a sinner, but uh, Paul, he wrote much of uh, our New Testament, and um, we read his writings, and we read what he says, and uh, I love reading about Paul, but uh, God versus our weaknesses. And, and number one uh, this evening, I'd like to look at his, but I'm talking about God, his perfect strength uh, versus my great weakness. His perfect strength versus my great weakness. The word perfect there that we read um, in verse 9, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. That word perfect is to make perfect complete. It's to, to carry through completely, to accomplish, to finish, to bring to an end. Uh, to complete is, uh, and I love this, it's add what is yet wanting in order to render a thing full. It's to add whatever is necessary to finish the task. That's what this word uh, perfect means. To bring to the, accomplish, uh, to the proposed goal to accomplish something. That's what uh, this word perfect means. So my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength, God's strength, is perfect in weakness. Now God doesn't have weaknesses. So that his perfect strength is not perfect in his weakness. His perfect strength is perfect in my weakness. Uh, the Bible says, and you can turn there if you'd like. I've got it in front of me. But in 2 Corinthians 5, the Bible says, not that, uh, excuse me, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. Sufficient is enough to meet the needs of a situation. I think each of us here could say, especially it seems to be brought even closer to our attention, but these last few months even. And, uh, but much of our lives, we've come up uh, against maybe situations or problems or, or times where we felt insufficient, uh, where we didn't feel like that we had enough to meet the needs of a situation. If I asked us to raise our hands, many would say, financially, uh, we felt insufficient before. We didn't have enough to meet the needs of the situation. Maybe we didn't have enough to pay that bill that was due. Or uh, we didn't have enough to get the groceries that we needed. Uh, and we could go on and on in each area of our lives, but we all know what it's like to be insufficient. Uh, not having enough to meet the needs of the situation. Let me give you just real quick four, four ways that things that Paul realized. I think Paul realized uh, he was strong. Paul realized that he was strong when he realized he was weak. And again, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> It doesn't make sense that uh, my very strength lies in the fact that I understand that I'm weak. <laughs> and it's not what I can do. It's all about his strength. And it's not about, uh, it's not about my weakness. Uh, uh, we, we see that Paul boasted. And, and we'll, we'll see that in a second. But it wasn't the fact that he was boasting how weak he was. He was boasting of the fact that uh, in his weakness, Christ was strong. And through the strength of Christ, Paul was able to be and accomplish what, able, what he was able to be and accomplish. He was strong when he realized he was weak. Uh, Paul realized he was sufficient when he realized his insufficiency. See, mo uh, many, uh, most people, myself included, I don't like to realize my insufficiency. I don't, like to, um, I don't like to see my insufficiency and look it in the face and realize that uh, I'm not enough. I don't like to look at my marriage and realize that I'm not enough to make this go like it's supposed to go. I don't like to look at my ministry and say, uh, look at my insufficiency. If, if it's up to me, I don't have what it takes. I don't have what it takes to uh, touch people's lives. I don't have what it takes to uh, help people. It, it's hard to do that. Look at my, uh, in the, as, I, uh, as I parent and, and raise my, uh, my son, and uh, it's hard for me to look at my insufficiency and come face to face with the realization that I can't parent him. I can't be the father that I need to be on my own. Paul realized some of these things. Uh, we see in 2 Corinthians 11, 6, Paul said he was rude in speech. Uh, Paul understood, and I think Paul realized what he lacked, some of the things he lacked. Uh, he, Paul realized in 2 Corinthians 12, 11 that he was nothing. And, and, but he says, and I know it's in at least two portions of Scripture in, in Corinthians, but he says, but uh, he wasn't any less than the chiefest of the apostles. And it wasn't because of his talent. It wasn't because of oh, everything that Paul in himself could do. Paul realized that it was uh, the, in his weakness he was strong. In his insufficiency he was sufficient. Paul knew what God's, that God's strength was perfect in his weakness. He realized that no matter how weak he was, God's strength could do whatever it was that God wanted him to do. Now, there are some, and I've heard this out so many things, uh, people will tell me that uh, through Christ, uh, everything's impossible, or excuse me, possible. 
And that is true. Uh, but the, the, the context there being is not that through Christ I can do whatever I want to do. The context is that through Christ, uh, He will do His will through me if I will let Him. And, and there are even, uh, when we go to Nigeria and, and much of West Africa, and, and I've been in, and even in other places, I've seen it here in the United States some, but uh, sometimes they, what, what, what they've done is uh, much of Nigeria is a Christian nation. Uh, they, uh, uh, they, they claim Christianity. In fact, many Nigerians I'll run across on the street, not run over or run over, but uh, something like that, but... Uh, many Nigerians that I'll have the opportunity to meet, if I ask them the question, uh, if, if you were to die today, are you 100% sure you're on your way to heaven? Many will answer yes. Uh, they're a very Christian nation, and what they'll tell me, and if I start digging into it and ask them, well, how do you know that? Much of the time, I'll find that they're trusting in their works. Uh, they're trusting in uh, who they are. Uh, they're trusting in uh, what their, uh, maybe their family's merits are. And what some of them have done is taken Christianity and then uh, some of their older religions uh, that have come out of their tribes and mixed them together and they come out uh, with this idea that uh, God is all-powerful so uh, He can will them to go farther than they ever could. But they're not even saved yet. And, and they get it in front of salvation and, and the prosperity gospel is preached over there to a great degree. But uh, Paul understood some of these things. God's strength is perfect. In my weak condition, there is no way that I could ever live the way that I ought to. It is only through the strength of Christ that I am able to function. Of course, we see uh, um, in the end of verse 9, the Bible says, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And now Paul, and sometimes when we, and I've even heard this talk with other people about this before, but Paul wasn't one who sat there and he said, Woe is me. Paul wasn't boasting and saying that I'm nothing. I'm a nobody. I can never do anything. I can never reach people. I can never help people. No. Paul was boasting in the fact that, yes, I'm a nobody, but he is in everything. He, uh, yes, I can do nothing, but he can do everything. Yes, I'm insufficient, but he is sufficient. Uh, so many Christians, when we think of pride, what do we think of? We think of that, that one who's boasted and so full of himself, and I can do everything, and I can never fail, and it's all about me. Uh, but what about the person who says, I can do nothing, God can never use me, uh, I have nothing to offer? See, that's both pride, because uh, what are both people looking at from themselves? Both people are looking at what they have or do not have, but the fact of the matter is, uh, in the Christian life, it's not about what I have or what I don't have, it's about uh, what I'm willing to give Him to use. And do I allow myself to be a channel that Christ uses to channel His love? that Christ uses to channel the, His will through me. The word glory to boast or vaunt. We are to glory in how weak we are and how it is only through power of Jesus Christ that we can live how we ought to live. It is only through, and by the way, that is the absolute truth tonight. It is only through the power of, of, of my Heavenly Father that I can live the way I ought to live. It's only through Him. And I've, there have been seasons of my life where I thought I could do it, where I, I could uh, make a difference where I thought I could bring people to church, and where I could, thought I could, if I worked hard enough, I could shock the world back to Christ. And uh, there have been seasons where I thought, man, I can start a revival, and if I just work hard enough, and if I just pray hard enough, and if I just uh, do the things that I know to do, I can do things. And, and the fact of the matter is, we do accomplish some things in some times. But what I found is, when, when I change a life, that life has not really changed. Uh, when I make a difference... No difference is really made. When I do it and when it's about me and when it's about my personality and how strong I am, the difference, if there's something, it doesn't last very long and it's not real. Unfortunately, I can look back at people that I influenced and I would say I influenced them for the cause of Christ, but looking back, I realized I influenced them for my cause because I had a purpose. And, uh, and if, if the truth were to be told, none of those people are doing what they're supposed to do, probably. Uh, because uh, any difference that I made is not a difference. The difference must be made by Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Excuse me. And allowing myself to be used of Him. So we see His perfect strength versus my uh, great weakness. And number two, I'd like to look at His ability versus my inability. The Bible says in 1 John 4, 16 and 17, uh, I'll read it. You can turn there if you like, but... The Bible says, and we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. 
Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as He is, so are we in this world. That was 1 John 4, 16 and 17. His ability versus my inability. And we go on and on about our, our inabilities. See, once again, um, going back to that idea of boasting or vaunting. See, when I talk about myself, and if I'm talking about sports, normally what I would want to tell people is what I'm good at. Right? In a sport, uh, in every sport you play, there are so many different parts to that sport. So uh, you can be a good player and some weaknesses in many areas. So uh, what I would do is I would say, man, I I'm good at this, this, and this. I wouldn't tell you what I'm bad at. Uh, but it's amazing that Paul, and it goes against our, our, our idea to, to, to boast or vaunt in the fact that what we're not good at, we like to say what we're good at. But the fact of the matter is, in the Christian life, we could say, uh, really, we're not good enough at anything, so we have nothing to boast or vaunt in except his power and who he is. But his ability versus my inability. His ability to, uh, number one, his ability to love. His ability to love people. All throughout your Christian life, uh, some of you have been in church for years and years, and what have you always been told to do? Love people, right? Uh, even the world knows that. Even the world knows that we ought to love our, uh, our enemies. The world would tell you that. They say, well, of course, we're supposed to love our enemies. We're to love our neighbor. We're to live the golden rule. We are to do those things. But we're told to love, and, and, and I found myself uh, thinking, how do you love somebody like you're supposed to? How do, I know I'm commanded to love, and I'm commanded to love my enemies, um, but there are sometimes my enemies, I don't want to love them. I don't want to take care of them. I don't want to turn the other cheek. I don't want to uh, uh, heap coals of fire upon their head, except I want to heap real coals of fire on their head or something maybe. How do I love somebody? But the fact of the matter is, it's not about how I can love that person. Because once, uh, once again, if I love that person in my strength, they're not going to be loved how they ought to love. If I try to uh, love my wife just how I know to love, she's not going to be uh, loved like she ought to be loved. But if I allow Jesus Christ and uh, my Heavenly Father to love through me, that's when I figured it out. His ability to love, our friends. Our fr Have you ever heard somebody say, I could never love that person? And what, what do we do? We, and I found myself doing that. Of course you can love them. God says to love them. You have to love them. And that is true. But the fact of the matter it is, is that it may be true that I cannot love that person. That is a true statement. Uh, and I'm sure pastors told the story before, but of course our dad came from a broken home. And uh, his dad left him when he was about 13 years old. And he didn't see him again until he graduated Bible college. And I won't tell the whole story, but uh, my dad made a conscious decision to love his dad. And to my grandpa's dying day, as far as I know, he never asked for forgiveness to my dad as far as I know, but my dad made a decision years and years ago uh, to love his dad. And my dad would tell you, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't because my dad was a super Christian and just said, man, I'm just going to love him hard enough to love him through. No, my dad allowed uh, the love of Christ to go through him to his father, which made a, a, a huge difference. Uh, because of that decision, I had a relationship with my grandpa. And, uh, I, and some of my cousins never had a relationship with their grandpa because um, they should I change something or are we good? Um, be, because their, um, because maybe their, their parents never made the decision my dad did. But the fact of the matter is, there are people who you cannot love. There are people who you cannot. It's only by, if you allow Jesus Christ to love through you. His ability to love, and Paul realized this. If you think of uh, Paul, uh, when he was changed and uh, when he got saved, uh, somehow, I don't think some of those feet, I mean, Paul was the one who held the garments when, when Stephen was stoned. You remember that? Uh, his, his human feelings, I don't think all of a sudden just changed. He thought, man, I love everyone around me. I just want to uh, be, be good to everybody. I think, uh, but I think what Paul realized is that he couldn't love people. I mean, he had hated them. He had killed them. He had, he had bl blood on his hands. But I think Paul realized that I cannot love some of these people, but I, uh, Paul allowed God to love through him. His ability to love our friends, our family, our enemies here. In, in this portion of uh, 1 John, the word perfect there is the same as the word perfect that we read earlier. And you remember that definition, to make perfect complete. Add what is yet wanting in order to render a thing full. Whatever ability I have to love people, it's wanting in some area. I know it is. So if I'll allow his perfect love to 
to add what is yet wanting to render it full. The only way to have a full and complete love for anybody, for your family, for your wife, your husband, for your friends, uh, for your enemies, the only way to have a perfect, and by the way, we can't have a perfect love. And when you stop and think of that, uh, that doesn't make sense that me as a fallen, a sinful person can have anything that's perfect. But it's through the grace of our Heavenly Father. Of course, that's one of the things we uh, have, have uh, access to when we get saved is we can love like uh, God does. We, we choose not to most of the time, but we can do that. The word perfect, of course, the same as the word perfect that we read. The only way of having a complete and perfect love for anyone is having the help of a perfect and complete and holy God. When it'll be a good day in our lives when we realize that I am insufficient. I cannot love people. And I, to be true, if I'm to be honest, I, I, don't th- I, can't, I don't think I can say throughout all my ministry I've had that. Because there have been seasons where I thought, man, I got it. I, I grew up a certain way, so I can love people. God's given me a, 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 a better way to love than most people. But what I found is I have what is yet wanting. And I need his perfect love to add what is yet wanting to render a thing full. Um, we can go to this pulpit, Mike, if that would be. I'll just keep, okay, I'll just keep going here. But, uh, so we see his ability to love. And then we see his ability to forgive. His ability to forgive. And uh, for sake of time, I won't go to all these portions of Scripture. But you think of uh, Jesus Christ on the cross. Of course, that was the uh, ultimate, in my mind, the ultimate uh, show of forgiveness. It wasn't a show. I don't mean to say it like that, but ultimate show of forgiveness. When Jesus Christ was hanging on the cross after hours and hours of torture and uh, mockery and uh, bleeding, uh, Isaiah, I believe Isaiah 53 uh, says that you, could, you couldn't even barely tell he was a form of a man because of what they'd done to him. And at that point, Jesus Christ, what did he say? Father, forgive them. If, if Jesus Christ could forgive them, I think he can help us forgive uh, our friends. And I'm not making light of the situation. Like I said, I, I'm not making light of the fact that you may say there's somebody I can't love, because I realize that's, that's true. And that's why I wanted to say that's a true statement. But, but the, uh, the, the Jesus who said, Father, forgive them, he's the one who can help you forgive. His ability to love, his ability to forgive. Oftentimes, the only way to forgive someone is through the power of God. See, everyone in here has been hurt by people. Because what are people? They're people. They're people and they're human at best. At best, they're pe- human and a human... Uh, I just messed all that up. They're human at best. Because that's the best we have to offer. And see, even the best things we do, what was the Bible called? Our righteousness is this filthy rag. The best thing anyone has to offer is still, uh, it's not good enough. And we deal with people. Everyone here has been hurt by somebody. But the fact of the matter is, I think there's probably somebody here who has been hurt, but hasn't forgiven yet. And you're still trying to forgive yourself. And sometimes you have good days, and sometimes you have bad days, right? Sometimes I think, man, those feelings of of anger and bitterness and hurt, they're gone. But they're never really gone until you actually forgive. And the fact of the matter is, you probably aren't going to actually forgive until you allow uh, God to forgive through you. His ability to forgive. Uh, so, uh, we've been hurt so dip, deeply that we feel there is forgive. And humanly speaking, you're right. But there's never a situation where God cannot help us forgive. We're talking about a perfect and holy God. Uh, we're talking about the, the God who sent his son and put the, uh, the weight of all the sin of, of mankind on his shoulders at one time and took that punishment for us and, and forgave. That's why we have our position as believers. That's how we're, oh, we're justified. When we're justified, we're looked at and treated as righteous. Uh, I love that, and uh, I get to preach quite a bit at different churches, and uh, I always try to sneak that in, because I love the idea that the God of heaven looks at me and treats me as righteous. He sees me as righteous, which that in itself is a miracle, because how can a perfect, holy, heavenly Father look at somebody like me and see righteousness? Righteousness is the absence of sin. But not only does he look at me and see me as righteous, but then he treats me as righteous. Because if he doesn't treat me as righteous, I still have to die and go to hell. Because only righteousness can enter into heaven. Uh, but we're, our, 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 our justification, our sanctification, uh, those things uh, w- when we get saved. But what is also given to us when we get saved is we have the Holy Spirit's help. And we can then, see an unsaved person, I don't think, can truly forgive somebody. An unsaved world, in their anger and their bitterness, I don't see any hope for them. Because those people who are truly unforgivable... 
Uh, you look at down through history and, and people who did terrible and uh, heinous crimes and humanly speaking are unforgivable. Uh, they've been forgiven. If they would ask you, they'd be forgiven by our Heavenly Father. But a non-believer can never do it. But I as a believer have the power of Christ in me. See, uh, an unbeliever, in their insufficiency, what are they? They're insufficient. In their weakness, what are they? They're still weak. But I as a believer am not anymore. I have the, the strength, and by the way, when you have the, put on the perfect strength of, of the God of God, you can't get any better than that. You can't be any more strong than that. His ability to love, his ability to forgive. God has forgiven the sins of the whole world. I think he can help us forgive. And I know that some some, sometimes can be a touchy subject. It can be a hard. And I'm not sitting here once again and saying this is something easy that happens, but I'm saying we do have access to the power of our Heavenly Father, His ability to love, to forgive, His ability to care. His ability to care. Wait. You know, there are people who I think I can never care for. Some people just turn you the wrong way, don't they? Whether it's how they wear, how they talk, how they look. Uh, some people, at, at, at my very human roots, they just, I don't want to be around them. There's only a couple people in this room. Not a, no, I'm joking. Uh, there are some people I, I would rather not associate with. And to be honest, it goes, some people, it goes farther than that. I drive by somebody, I think, man, I, not only do I not want to associate with that person, I'd, I'd rather just block them out of my memory and not even care about them. It's just another person. I, I, I'm ashamed to say that I've thought those very thoughts before. But see, I'm, I'm saved now. I'm a Christian. And I have, I have God's help to care for that person. So you can say, I can never care about, I can never take the time to help that person. But through Christ, in your weakness, his, his perfect strength, which includes you caring for people. And by the way, he's commanded us to care. He's commanded us to love. He's commanded us to forgive. It's, these, these things I'm talking about, they're not choices and they're not the ideas to consider. Well, should I, should I forgive? Should I love? Should I care? These are commands by our Heavenly Father. But aren't you glad when God commands us to do something, he gives us the power to fulfill that command. Uh, when God gave the Great Commission, he gave us the power to fulfill that command. When, when God gave, uh, I'm so glad that uh, when I go to Africa, I'm not going to wake up five, five years from now and say, man, uh, or God's not going to wake up and say, man, oh, I forgot I sent him to the mission field. Uh, I forgot uh, he's over there in Africa. See, when God gives a command, when, when God tells us to do something, uh, God will never uh, send you any farther than he equips you to go. So when he told you to love, you're equipped. You have what you need to love. When he tells us to care, we have what we need to care. When he tells us to forgive, we have the capability of forgiveness. Uh, so we've seen so far his, his, his perfect strength versus our great weakness, his ability versus our in, inability, and lastly, and I'll finish with this, we see his purpose versus our plan. See, Paul, before that road to Damascus, uh, his plans did not involve getting blind. They did not uh, involve uh, spending the rest, much of uh, the rest of his life uh, traveling and on ships and walking much of the time, I believe, and in prisons and in uh, being rushed out of cities before the mob found him to kill him. Uh, before his conversion, his, his plans, I don't, Paul's plans weren't like that. In fact, Paul's plans were the opposite. He wanted to seek and to destroy. But the day when, when Paul got saved, his purpose uh, took over Paul's plans. And I hope each of us would allow, we can be saved and still not allow his purpose, his purpose to take over our plan. See, I can be saved and on my way to heaven and still be living my way and doing my thing. And, and to be honest, sometimes uh, my way and my thing isn't necessarily wrong. Sometimes my way and my thing is still serving in the church and, and, and doing what I'm supposed to do. But even if my way and my plans aren't necessarily wrong, if they're not his purpose for my life, then they become wrong because I'm to do his plan and to do his purpose. And by the way, God does have a purpose for each of our lives. I remember my dad would always say, if, if you're living and breathing, you still have purpose. And that is the case. Uh, you still have purpose. And Pastor mentioned it today. Uh, it, it's not the fact that God has to use us or, or needs us. It's a, it's a fact of the matter that he wants to use us. See, God saved it by his grace and his mercy, his his grace and us getting what we don't deserve and his mercy and us not getting what we do deserve, God saved us. And just that, that alone is amazing, but not only did God save us by his grace and his mercy, but then he gave us purpose while we're here on this earth. He gave us a reason for being here. 
Uh, God's plan is not just for us to spend our X amount of years, however many years we have and our breathing living on this earth and just to spend it and then go uh, live in heaven for eternity. So many Christians will do that. God has a purpose. God has a plan. Uh, there's almost 8 billion people in the world. Those are people are part of our purpose. They're part of our plan. And once again, we are insufficient to do that plan. But the whole message tonight is I hope you realize you're insufficient. See, much of the world today wants to pump you up with a motivational uh, message, and even many Christians today want to pump you up and uh, find who you are, find, find yourself, and, and, and find what you can do. I hope I never find who I am and find what I can do because I'll be very sadly disappointed. But if I'll find who I am in Christ, and the day I got saved, how my position changed with Christ, and realize that my insufficiency is my very strength. Because it's the time when I realize that I can do nothing and I need him to do everything. That's when I think God can truly work and truly start to move in our lives. And we can truly start to find his purpose versus our plans. I hope you think about that tonight. And I know it's not a, a Christmas message by necessarily any means. But I hope you understand and be encouraged. That it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter. Uh, all of us here could, uh, if we were to write an essay on the disappointments and the times we messed up and made mistakes. Some of your papers will be longer than others, but we'd all have a really long essay and really long uh, paper showing all the things we messed up and done wrong to this point. But guess what? He's, his strength is still greater than our weakness. Not only is it greater, it actually, uh, we allow him to work through our weakness. So I challenge you to think about that, and I think God can use us just like he used the Apostle Paul. I'll pray and turn it over to Pastor. Dear Heavenly Father, thanks so much for all you've done. Father, thank you so much, and help us to understand how insufficient we really are and how weak we really are and allow you to work through us. Father, I ask that you would uh, just do whatever you would want to in these next few moments and days and months. And uh, Father, help us just to yield ourselves wholly uh, to you and hold nothing back and allow you to do with us what you'd want to do. And it's your son Jesus' name that we pray. Paul was strong when he recognized he was weak. Many times we won't admit that in our lives. We know, we understand, we can do it. Heavenly Father, God, Lord, we think tonight, Lord, too often, Lord, we are so self-centered. And God, I pray that you would help us to understand that Lord, we are desperately in need of you. But I pray each one of us tonight would take some time to examine ourselves and see if we've depended on you this week or if it's been too much about us. God, we recognize your grace is sufficient for us. In Jesus' name, amen. The verse before the, the verses he was reading tonight talk about uh, something that Cause Paul trouble. We don't know what that is. I don't exactly know what that is. People speculate what that was. But the very next verse, he says, "My grace is sufficient." Or excuse me, "Thy grace is sufficient for me." And uh, whatever it is you're facing, God's grace is sufficient for us. And Amen. Thank you, Danny. We appreciate that. Thank you all for being faithful to God's house. Uh, Wednesday night, we'll be here and uh, just be faithful, and we'll see what God will do. Thank you for joining us online. We appreciate you and. Remember, serve the Lord this week, wherever you're at, whatever you're doing, share the gospel with somebody and uh, serve him. All right. God bless you. Have a great week. We love you all. Uh, take care.